Every year, archaeologists uncover new sites that enrich our understanding of the past. Despite many similarities, each site has a unique tale to tell about ancient social structures, technology, architecture, and above all, how people made sense of life, death, and the world around them. In our modern world, we often distance ourselves from our deceased relatives. Our settlement layouts clearly distinguish between spaces for the living and the dead. It's remarkable to discover how closely some ancient societies lived alongside their deceased loved ones. Unlike today's tendency to avoid confronting death, the inhabitants of Chattel Hoyuk, a Neolithic village settlement, slept on platforms where their ancestors were buried. The settlement served as both a living space and a cemetery. In stark contrast to modern attitudes towards death, ancient cultures at Chattelhoyuk placed death at the heart of their rituals and daily life. Welcome to Anthromedia. In this video, we will explore Chattelhoyuk, an ancient settlement located in present-day Turkey. Chattelhoyuk was first excavated by James Mellard in the 1960s. The site consists of two mounds, the Neolithic East Mound and the Chalcolithic West Mound. The East Mound, dating from 7,400 to 6,000 BC, is around 21 meters high. Its large size of about 13.5 hectares and complex art make it an important site outside the Southwest Asian Cradle of Civilization. While Chattelhoyuk is no longer seen as exceptionally unique due to the discovery of other significant sites, it remains distinctive in several ways. Although many Neolithic sites have been found in central Turkey and the Konya Plain, Chattelhoyuk stands out for the sheer amount of art and the detailed record of daily life it provides. Chattelhoyuk displays a strange blurring between the secular and the symbolic, even to the point of depositing objects that created memories of past events, such as parts of figurines and hearths or foundations. Chattelhoyuk's extensive art, detailed record of daily life, and unique construction methods make it a significant site for understanding the Neolithic period. The continuous resurfacing of floors and walls, along with the way houses were abandoned and rebuilt, provides an unparalleled glimpse into the daily lives of its inhabitants over thousands of years. Excavations reveal densely packed houses with roof entrances, at its peak, the population estimates for the site range from 3,500 to 8,000 people. Despite extensive survey work, there is little evidence of public buildings, industrial areas, separate cemeteries, and ceremonial centers. All buildings are domestic houses, though they vary in internal elaboration. One indication of large-scale divisions of the Neolithic East Mound is a large dip or trough across the middle dividing it into two hills. The mound does seem to have developed in two halves. The southern, higher eminence continued to be occupied after the general abandonment of the northern hill. In addition, we have found some differences in consumption and sheep herding behavior. Some research indicates genetic differences in the people buried on the two sides. Beyond the large-scale division of the settlement into two parts, smaller groupings of houses have been identified at Chattel Hoyuk. In the latter layers of the site, there is evidence of winding streets between houses. Recent research has uncovered alleyways or boundaries between sectors of the mound, each containing 10 to 50 houses. Within these sectors, there are even smaller groups of houses with social and economic connections. Small groups of three to six houses often share a common main house, which may have served as a communal burial site. These main houses, known as history houses, have more burials and more architectural features like platforms and pillars. History houses were rebuilt over longer periods, but they did not control production or storage and did not have wealthier burials. The social differences between history houses and other houses were minimal. 
At Chattahoyuk, much of the community's economic, social, and ritual life took place at the household level. Most houses consisted of a main room and one to three side rooms used for storage and food preparation. The main rooms had frequently replastered walls, with the entrance ladder or stairs usually located on the south wall above the oven and hearth. The northern part of the main room was typically higher, cleaner, and more often replastered, and this is where most paintings, sculptures, installations, and burials were found. Although it is often said that the houses were dark, an experimental house built at the site showed that the main rooms were quite bright during the day due to light coming in from the ladder entry. The white plastered walls also helped reflect light, making the side rooms reasonably well lit. People worked with obsidian near the ladder entries and stored it in caches there, possibly because of the need for good lighting. The rooms were likely smoky due to layers of soot found on the plaster walls. Frequent replastering was probably necessary to maintain light reflection. Evidence of carbon residues on the ribs of older individuals buried beneath the floors suggests that people spent significant time indoors, especially during harsh winters. Both the young and the old had a close relationship with the house, as seen in the burials of children and neonates near doors and hearths. The house was a central place for living, especially during winter and for the very young and old. This provided opportunities for socialization, teaching social roles, and creating routines within the community. Inside the houses, space usage was highly repetitive, with main rooms plastered more frequently than side rooms. The main room floors often had different levels, with the higher areas covered in white plaster. These white floors may have been more heavily covered to keep them clean. The burial practices varied within the house. Different categories of people were buried under different platforms, with young people often under the Northwest platform and older individuals under the Central East platform. The art and symbolism were also spatially divided, with paintings and sculptures more common on the East and West walls and vulture paintings only on the north and east walls. At Chattelhoyuk, houses took on many roles that used to belong to the community. In earlier sites in Anatolia and West Asia, burials often happened between buildings or in special structures such as Chayonu, but at Chattelhoyuk, burials were mostly inside houses. Activities like food preparation, symbolism and rituals, which used to be public as illustrated by Gobekli Tepe, were now done inside the house. Houses became key places for teaching social roles and behaviors. However, this shift made individual houses more important at the expense of the larger community. In the upper levels of the site, there's evidence of economic changes and the breakdown of community-wide rules houses started to function more independently, and the strong social cohesion of the community began to weaken. In the Neolithic period, unlike hunter-gatherer societies who lived in the present, people at Chattelhoyuk lived in a world deeply connected to the past. The settlement's deep layers, with houses built on top of one another, display how they managed and preserved their history. Many houses at Chattelhoyuk were lived in for 50 to 100 years, and maintaining these mud brick structures was a challenge. The walls tended to lean and bend, so the people developed techniques like doubling the walls, building houses close together for support, and using horizontal wooden braces in the walls. When a house was abandoned, it was sometimes used as a dump site, other times, new houses were built in the same spot, using the same layout over multiple rebuilds. Long-lived houses often had more burials beneath their floors. While the average house had five to eight burials, some had as many as 62, including secondary burials from other houses. The use of space in history houses remained consistent over time, helping to establish and maintain historical memories. This consistency is seen in repeated paintings and relief sculptures across different phases and levels of the buildings.
For instance, pairs of relief leopards appear in several buildings, and in two cases they are placed directly above each other in a distinctive style, suggesting deliberate commemorative memory. These history houses often contained human remains, with many burials beneath the floors. Sometimes body parts were retrieved and reused. For example, teeth from one skeleton were placed in another individual's jaw in a later building. Skulls were especially significant and were sometimes kept and placed at the base of house posts or added to burials. One notable example is in a building where the tops of upright wooden pillars were plastered to place a human skull on top of it. The practice of creating and maintaining histories at Chattelhoyuk involved the repetition of house construction and passing down human skulls. At Chattelhoyuk, the house played a key role in preserving memory. This is also seen with wild animal heads. There was a common pattern of destroying the west walls of the main rooms to remove sculptures. The heads and feet, hands of relief figures, likely depicting bears, were always removed before buildings were filled in. The wild bull was a prominent image in Chattelhoyuk's art and was important in feasting. The bones of wild male cattle were often found in large quantities, suggesting they were used in significant feasts. Although these feasting activities might not have been concentrated in the history houses, but wild bull horns were often displayed in these elaborately decorated houses. In the latter period of Chattelhoyuk, the tradition of creating elaborate houses with real bull horns, reliefs, and paintings declined. Bull horns and wild animal parts were less frequently used in house decorations, and some horns were made of plaster rather than real ones. This shift might be due to a decrease in wild cattle and other wild animals in the area. Instead of using real wild animals, people began to represent them in pottery and paintings. In later periods, small symbolic bull heads appeared as handles on pottery, and paintings depicted scenes of teasing and baiting wild animals, which introduced a narrative element to their art. Stamp seals with abstract signs also emerged, suggesting a more symbolic and discursive approach to rituals. In the upper levels, obsidian hordes ceased and pottery became more diverse and decorated. By the Chalcolithic period, about 6000 BC, pottery featured complex designs. Burial practices also changed with fewer adult burials inside houses. Instead, there were collective burials in decorated tombs and associations of animal and human bones, indicating evolving rituals. House construction and urban layout transformed. Houses became larger, multi-roomed, and often two-story, with buttresses added to support the walls. The town became more dispersed and fragmented, with the emergence of streets and street-level entrances. A combination of economic independence from domestic animal and cereal production and external factors like climate change might have influenced this shift. The occupation at Chattelhoyuk can be divided into three periods. The early phase was from 7,030 BC, the middle phase was from 6,600 BC, and the later phase was from 6,400 BC. During its peak in the middle period, the population and housing density were at their highest. Towards the end of the occupation on the East Mound, the surrounding environment changed from a wetland to a more stable, dry ground. Various analyses confirm this by showing a decline in fish, mollusks, wood, and plant diversity. Consequently, the population declined, houses were more spaced out, and there was an increased use of open spaces. The site was eventually abandoned by around 6000 BC, shifting towards multiple small to medium-sized early Chalcolithic sites instead of a single dense settlement. This transition coincided with a significant global climate event around 6200 BC, which brought drought conditions to much of Africa and Asia. These climatic changes likely contributed to the end of the East Mound occupation and the relocation to the West Mound. 
At Chattel Hoyuk, there was little evidence of specialized roles or distinct political and social functions. Instead, the town appeared to function through the repetition of social behaviors within individual houses. Daily routines reinforced social order, teaching people the roles and rules of their society. These routines were embedded in a rich symbolic system centered around wild animals and ancestors buried under the floors. Rather than having a centralized hierarchy or public ceremonies, social rules and rituals were learned and enforced within each house. The elaborate house-based symbolism and rituals provided a strong sense of power and meaning. This focus on domestic cults and body regulations contributed to the formation of a very large village rather than a traditional town. To access the rights and resources associated with a house, individuals needed to be part of its history and symbolism. This often meant being physically connected to the house's fabric and its burials. As the site grew, houses likely clustered around history houses with many burials and a long period of reuse. Being near these ancestral homes was crucial for maintaining social and resource rights. Over time, economic and environmental changes led to a shift. In the later part of the 7th millennium BC, there was a move towards more intensive use of domesticated plants and animals, reducing reliance on wild animals. Houses transformed from ritual centers to centers of production and consumption. The history house system declined, and houses became larger and multi-roomed. Chattel Hoyuk flourished largely due to its control over the obsidian trade, a valuable volcanic glass sourced from nearby mountains. However, obsidian was just one among many materials traded by Southwest Asian farmers starting around 9000 BC. Items like marine shells, jadeite, serpentine, turquoise, and other exotic goods were exchanged through barter across villages. These exchanges likely served not only to acquire rare materials, but also to strengthen social ties. The widespread trade of raw materials accelerated the spread of innovations such as shepherding, pottery making, and eventually metallurgy of copper and bronze. Studies using spectrographic analysis of obsidian fragments from hundreds of sites across Turkey and Mesopotamia show that each obsidian source has distinct trace elements allowing researchers to trace its distribution from various locations. The percentage of obsidian found decreases with distance from its source, suggesting that early farming communities engaged in down-the-line bartering, passing goods along from village to village. Chattelhoyuk relied on domesticated plants and animals, with wheat dominating the crops and sheep being the most common livestock. Wild plants and animals were also consumed but were less important in the diet. The community's symbolic art, depicting wild animals and hunting scenes, suggests that hunting held social significance despite being a minor part of their diet. Most farming likely occurred in better drained areas 13 kilometers south of the settlement, requiring considerable labor and mobility for cultivation and transport. Evidence suggests increased mobility over time, with herders traveling greater distances to find resources. Additionally, raw materials for bead and pottery making shifted from local to non-local sources, indicating expanded territory use. This shift resulted from a move from community-based to household-based economies, leading to greater resource depletion near the settlement and necessitating further travel for resources. Over 300 skeletons were uncovered at Chattel Hoyuk. Analysis showed a preference for primary, single burials and oval pits under house floors. Bodies were often flexed and sometimes wrapped in cloth or accompanied by various grave goods like shells, beads, and tools. Most burials lacked grave goods though some showed evidence of dismemberment or missing skulls and limbs. One plastered and painted skull was found with an adult female skeleton, similar to other Near Eastern finds. 
Archaeological surveys of the Kanya Plain show a pattern of increasing population density and habitation, culminating in the emergence of Chattel Hoyuk as a prominent community. Initial small settlements in the region, like Bankuklu Hoyuk, may have amalgamated to form Chattel Hoyuk, transforming from a few dispersed dwellings into a large, dense settlement. Population growth at Chattel Hoyuk was likely driven by increased fertility and birth rates. The site's skeletal remains reveal a high percentage of juveniles, indicating a higher birth rate. Traditional interpretations of high juvenile mortality have shifted to understanding these numbers as a sign of population growth and fertility. Juvenility indexes show a peak in population growth during the middle period, followed by a decline in the late period. Other factors, such as immigration, might have contributed to population growth, but evidence suggests this was unlikely. Settlement data show little population outside of Chattel Hoyuk during its peak, and analysis reveals no significant influx of migrants. The diet at Chattel Hoyuk played a crucial role in sustaining its high population growth. Analysis of plant and animal remains indicates a heavy reliance on cereal grains, particular wheat and barley, and domesticated animals, especially sheep. There is an observed increase in a higher consumption of animal protein, possibly due to the introduction of domesticated cattle. Breastfeeding led to higher nitrogen values in infants, which began to decline around 18 months as weaning started and return to baseline levels by about three years. This pattern is typical of traditional farming societies and indicates that children were vulnerable to infections during the weaning process due to a compromised immune system. Chattelhoyuk's social structure was characterized by a shift towards practical kinship and household-centric organization, driven by the demands of early farming practices and communal living. This departure from traditional biological kinship models highlights the adaptive nature of social organization in response to agricultural intensification and community consolidation during the Neolithic period.